Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Collaborative, the Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series. Thank you for joining us. Today, we'll be talking about how to expand mentoring relationships with opportunity youth. I'm Dusty Ann North from California, and I'll be facilitating today's conversation. Um, just to give you a little background about me and my interest in today's topic, I am a training and a trainer and technical assistance provider for youth mentoring and related youth services fields since 1995. I have a focus on youth and families in high distress, including transition aged youth, which we'll be talking about today. Um, I do a lot of work bridging research and practice towards quality evidence-based services. I'm a lecturer and researcher at UC Berkeley School of Social Welfare, and I am the research director for the California Mentoring Partnership. Uh, convening researchers and advocates to initiate new mentoring research. And I'm excited to be here today. Thanks for having me. Let's get started. This webinar is part of the Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series, which is funded by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention through the National Mentoring Resource Center and facilitated in partnership with Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership. These webinars would not be possible without the planning team, which includes the mentoring partnerships shown on this slide. In addition to this webinar series, the NMRC provides resources for mentoring practitioners. At the end of this webinar, we'll provide more details about how you can access this no-cost free support. Before we get started, I wanted to share some housekeeping information. In one week, you'll receive an email with information about how to download a copy of these slides and view the webinar recording. You can also access information directly by going to Mentor's website in the next week. And to continually improve these series, we look for your input. A short survey will pop up as you exit the webinar. Please take three minutes to give us your feedback. We also want this to be a, part a participatory experience, so please use the question box to, answer que to ask questions throughout the webinar. Desiree Robinson will be queuing up questions to share with the panelists during the Q&A portion of the webinar. We may not get to all the questions because there are several hundred of you on the webinar, but we will do our best. The questions that we share with our panelists are generally ones that broaden or deepen the conversation. First, to get a sense of who's with us today, we have two short polls. The first one asks, what is your experience level in the mentoring field? And you can select beginner, experienced, or expert. So the poll is open now. Um, if you look for that on your screen, you can go ahead and click your answer. Okay, it looks like we have a, a, a nice mix in the crowd today. It uh, looks like around 38% of you are beginners. Many of you are experienced, about 60%, and a couple of you think of yourselves as experts. Welcome to you all. Now let's take one more poll. What is your role in the mentoring field? So practitioner, researcher, technical assistance provider, funder, or other. Go ahead and click your answers there. All right, looks like the lion's share of you are practitioners, a couple of researchers, uh, some technical assistance providers, about 15% of you, and 23% are other, which piques my interest. I'm curious what other folks are, but we'll find out about that later, hopefully. Um, so we welcome everyone, and we think and hope that today's information will be applicable to everyone on the line. Um, so I personally am thrilled to be discussing this topic today, which is mentoring for opportunity youth. Recent years of research and practice have shown that the transition to adulthood is not only a profound time of change and growth for many youth, but also one of the most challenging to navigate in today's society. It is truly a time of sink or swim for many of our youth with repercussions that go throughout the lifespan. Um, opportunity youth are an important segment of this age group and their success may impact not only their own lives but our workforce and our society at large. So with that in mind, here are some of the, the objectives that we hope to accomplish today. Um, there's several questions we hope to explore. The first is who are opportunity youth? Oh, I'm still on the previous slide, please. 
Um, the first question is, who are Opportunity Youth and why engage them in mentoring? And how is Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership, engaging, uh, engaging the field and serving this population? We also want to look at what are some special needs and considerations in mentoring for Opportunity Youth? What are some of the ways in which mentoring is implemented with this population? And how can more of the field get involved? What are some lessons learned and best practices recommendations? So those are our goals for today. And it looks like we've already moved to the next slide, which is our, uh, our agenda for today. Briefly, uh, we'll first hear from our four illustrious panelists. The first is Dan Horgan from Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership. And as the Senior Director of Corporate Engagement at Mentor, he'll provide some context and information about opportunity use, as well as an overview of Mentor's approach to serving them. Then our other presenters all represent partner programs who work actively with Mentor to expand services to this population. Um, so we're excited to welcome Deborah Anglin from Hearts to Nourish Hope, Corey Manning from Youth Build USA Incorporated, and Gregory Meeves from uh, Marriott Foundation. And once our, uh, and so these folks will give a, a sort of a sense of the various program models that are utilized in mentoring opportunity youth. Then later in the session, we'll have more of an interactive presentation of lessons learned and best practices recommendations. And at the end, we'll answer as many of your questions as possible. So please keep those questions flowing in the chat box throughout the webinar, and we'll get to as many as we can. All right, uh, next slide. So with that, I'd like to introduce Daniel Horgan. Um, at Mentor, Daniel is responsible for building and managing corporate partnerships that help close the youth mentoring gap in America while meeting business goals. Dan has over 20 years experience working in the business and nonprofit sectors, having served as executive director at Generation On, vice president of development at the Heart of America Foundation, senior director of community affairs at Capital One, youth program officer at the Three Rivers Work Investment Board, and executive director of Pittsburgh Cares. Daniel has extensive experience training, consulting, and coaching in the areas of leadership, management, organizational development, and public-private partnerships. He's worked with Fortune, excuse me, Fortune 100 companies, national and local nonprofits, school districts, and government. Daniel is also the author of Tell Me I Can't and I Will. He resides in New York City. Welcome, Dan. Thanks, Sophie all right, so I'm gonna just kick us off in terms of providing a little bit of context um, on Opportunity Youth and to share just the model that we use at Mentor uh, for a really unique program that engages all of the other panelists uh, that are part of today's program. Uh, just to kick us off, just to get us grounded in the definition of Opportunity Youth, as we've worked across the country, we've acknowledged the fact that there are various definitions and ways in which people are looking at Opportunity Youth uh, in the field. And so we just want to start by saying, according to Measure of America, which is a fantastic resource uh, that you can get very specific data around the opportunity youth population at a state, regional, or city level. There are close to 5 million young people between the ages of 16 to 24 that are disconnected currently from education and work. I think it's important to ground us in the, at the top of this particular session to say that those young people are uh, experiencing various levels of disconnection. So think of it as almost a spectrum of disconnection uh, where some young people uh, are maybe two steps away from that connection point that's really going to help propel them forward in terms of their educational goals or in terms of employability that moves them up uh, in terms of their career goals and economic stability. Other opportunity youth are uh, experiencing multiple aspects of disconnection uh, that really uh, sort of are grounded in just basic sort of uh, the, the, the core, of core needs that we need just to survive. So for example, they might be struggling with uh, stable housing, making sure that they have got food on the table, making sure that they um, have access to just basic healthcare services or quality healthcare services within their communities. So there's all these sort of various levels that it's important to keep in mind that we can't look at opportunity use as a general um, group experiencing all of the same things. Uh, you meet one opportunity youth, you meet one opportunity youth. Uh, the other thing that I would just highlight here in, in terms of context is that it's important for us as a field to take both a proactive and a reactive approach to our work. So in other words, uh, really act, reactive in the sense that there are a lot of young people, obviously, that are already disconnected, and we're trying to reconnect them to opportunities that help propel them forward. There's also an opportunity for us as a field to learn from that work 
and to apply it to a proactive strategy to limit the number of young people that become disconnected from uh, a variety of supports within their communities. Mentoring is really viewed as a core strategy uh, that brings these young people back into a sense of connection and strengthens their overall infrastructure, their overall sort of foundational support. And obviously it does all the things that you see in the visual that's on the screen from providing them with the motivation and the confidence to, to take the steps forward in, in terms of pursuing their goals, as well as the advice or the life experiences, the coaching that mentors can provide uh, opportunity youth as they're trying to navigate all of these uh, various obstacles and choices that they're faced with. At the end of the day, it really comes down to the fact that mentoring is an opportunity for us to increase young people's access to new relationships or networks of support and the experiences, the opportunities to both further develop their skills and further connect to uh, experiences that are going to help propel them forward uh, academically as well as uh, professionally. If we move to the next slide, we also wanted to ground this at the top of the session and just understanding some of the key needs and considerations uh, from all of our work uh, collectively in, with Opportunity Youth across the country. And I think the first point is the most important from um, understanding that Opportunity Youth have faced all of these various obstacles and struggles and from a strength-based approach have developed a strong sense of resiliency to be able to navigate those obstacles and those challenges uh, as they move forward and trying to figure out, again, some things like housing, transportation, food, healthcare, as well as what to do upon graduating from high school or if they've dropped out of school, how to reconnect to opportunities uh, that can help them stabilize um, you know, their basic financial situations. It's also important to understand that for many of these young people, the transition to adulthood is often very unstructured, often um, sort of piecemealed across the community. So in other words, they have to navigate across lots of different service providers, lots of different outreach support to be able to piece together the foundation that they need to be able to continue to grow uh, and strengthen um, you know, where they're going in life. And so as a field, there's an opportunity for us to not just look at the work that we do in our silo, but how do we sort of break through the silos across programs and organizations within a community to provide a more streamlined, a more efficient approach to making sure that young people don't fall through the cracks, that they don't um, have to experience an overcomplicated process to really piece together the types of supports and services that they need uh, to be able to move forward. Again, as I mentioned earlier, there's all these sorts of challenges and obstacles that Opportunity Youth may be facing. It's important to keep in mind that in some cases, they might be facing one of these, and in other cases, they might be facing 10 of these. Everything from uh, being in the foster care system to having been in or in currently the juvenile justice system. Maybe they're facing a disability. Maybe they've experienced various levels of poverty, or maybe they're uh, working through various mental health issues. All of those things in combination need to be addressed in, toward, in terms of really strengthening their sense of uh, a foundation upon which to build uh, the lives that they want for themselves. And so just lastly, as we think about the approach of this work, I think it's really important that we look at it from a relationship lens versus a transactional lens. What I mean by that is, again, all of these different services that might be out there in the community, a young person has to go and complete an application or show up at an orientation or complete a training, each of which can feel like another to-do item on a to-do list. If we took the time to understand that young person's context and meet them where they were or are, we as mentors and as providers can really provide much more of a relationship approach, a relationship-driven approach to guiding them through all of those various services and supports that they need to strengthen that foundation and to really move forward. So just lastly, I, I wanted to show you on the next slide a picture of what that model might look like. Uh, and really, again, just celebrating the fact that the three uh, other panelists that I have the opportunity to, to share today's session with are all a part of a really unique, innovative pilot model right now called the National Mentoring Project. I know, super creative name. Um, but this model is essentially uh, being tested in five different cities, including Atlanta, Chicago, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and Seattle. And the ultimate goal is to increase the relationship support that opportunity youth have both on the path to employment and then once employed. And secondly, 
the ultimate goal is to not just get them into a job, but to ultimately retain them within the workforce. So as they get their first job or get a job that's more stable, there is clear opportunity and support in place to help them navigate that job so that they move either within that same company or they move across companies to take advantage of growth opportunities. And again, opportunities to strengthen their, their financial situations and pursue whatever goals that they've personally set for themselves. The model really puts in place community-based mentors uh, that have been trained and monitored and supported for those youth as they navigate their path to employment. And then once employed, we also put in place workplace-based mentors to help them get acclimated to those new jobs and to really navigate uh, all of the different benefits or opportunities that might be available to them uh, with those employers. So that's just a quick overview, a quick recap of the National Mentoring Project. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dusty Ann to, to move to the next. Thank you, Dan. Wonderful context and background and great to hear what Mentor is doing um, to support this population of youth. And um, I just wanna reiterate how important those, those special needs and considerations are. Um, when serving this youth, these youth and hoping that everyone can really keep those in mind as we um, continue the conversation. Um, so um, now we want to turn and hear from some of the programs that are serving Opportunity Youth uh, in partnership with Mentor. First, I'd like to present Deborah Anglin, who is the founder and CEO of Hearts to Nourish Hope Incorporated. Hearts was established over 22 years ago, and Deborah has over 30 years experience working in prevention with high-risk youth. She got her start as owner and instructor of a school for the martial arts and as a third degree black belt in Chang Su Do, Deborah was able to teach her young students the art as well as incorporating the vital life skills important to future success. That initial idea is the foundation that Hearts to Nourish Hope stands upon today. Deborah is very active in the community. She sat on various advisory boards. Um, some of them are listed here. And uh, Deborah stands firm in the belief of meeting youth where they are and helping to fill in the missing pieces that will enable them to be productive. She understands that collaboration with others is key to achieving this goal and does so at every opportunity. Deborah works tirelessly and is passionate about her mission in life. She feels that if she has helped one youth receive a better outlook and the understanding that there is a world beyond their backyard, then she has succeeded in her life's mission. Deborah is married to Mark Anglin and has two adult children, Nicholas and Connor. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you. Um, you covered a lot. Thanks. Um, we've been around for um, 23 years now, and we really try to positively impact lives um, by offering that innovative programming, um, collaboration with everyone within our community, and offering a lot of essential um, services such as the housing and food and clothing. Um, we have transitional living programs, we have work programs, we're connected to the colleges and technical schools, our, our government, our regular high schools, um, and elementary and middle schools as well. We offer a lot of credentialing. Um, we are primary, we are, um, workforce investment. We are funded through WIOA, which is Workforce Investment Opportunity Act funding. We offer credentialing, paid and unpaid internships. And we want to find employment with an ongoing career ladder. So in a nutshell, that's what HEART does. We can go to the next slide. And then um, our program, we're real excited about this program because we've always, we've done mentoring kind of forever, but not really, really super formalized. So this has kind of given us an opportunity to um, pull a great program together. And these are just some of the things that we focus on. One is you got to get everybody on board. You got to make sure that everyone is really vested and is getting something out of it. Um, when we were recruiting mentors, we went to our partners. These are people who come in and say, I want to help. Um, what can I do? And so we, we said, we got something for you to do and got some good buy-in there. And then we made sure that everybody really understood what was expected of them and also kind of what wasn't expected of them. No, we don't mentor expect you to be paying for everything for these mentees. And mentees, um, this is what you can expect. This person is not going to get you employment, but they're going to help you along the way and that you have to really put in some energy and be a partner 
and and understand what your goals are and work together with everybody. Um, that commitment, of course, is always important. Some of the things we did was we did some meet and greets before we did the matching and um, let them do different activities to get to know each other, understand um, who they might like. So we even allowed the both the mentors and the mentees to kind of make a list of three or four people during these activities that they felt would be a good match. And then we did a mentor matching ceremony where um, everybody got pinned. We had these little pins. And so it was a really neat celebration to kick everything off. Um, we created a team and making sure, again, that strategic matching was there. And we let everybody know that we're here to support them as our agency and our staff. And then we, we fostered and, and helped them to understand that, that positive, open, and honest communication, getting to know each other. It's a partnership and a collaborative, not I'm going to tell you what to do, but get to know each other and work together. And that's really what, um, what our program is about here. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Deborah, for sharing about hearts. Really great to hear about that. Next, I'm pleased to welcome Corey Manning, who has over 20 years' experience in the mentoring field, including helping guide programs in developing evidence-based mentoring models. He's managed multiple federal grants and coordinated and conducted professional and personal development training, both nationally and internationally. Topics of these trainings have included the elements of effective practice of mentoring, mentoring 101 for mentors and mentees, leadership development, conflict resolution, substance abuse and addiction prevention, education, and diversity. Take it away, Corey. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be a part of this, uh, this group, and this is the first time I think I've ever been uh, recognized as being illustrious, so I just want to put that out there. Um, I just want to talk, start off by telling you a little bit about Youth Build USA for those that, that are not familiar. Youth Build USA, which is celebrating our 40th year anniversary, is an international uh, nonprofit organization helping opportunity youth 16 to 24 obtain high school diploma or high school equivalency while, while learning a trade uh, like construction and for many other workforce development and occupational skills. Uh, under the leadership of our CEO, John Valverde, we are president in in over 260 urban and rural youth build programs in 44 states across the U.S., uh, as well as 21 countries, uh, we are, are, are present um, under Youth Build International. So that's uh, how I'm paid to describe Youth Build USA and Youth Build programs. This is how I like to describe it myself. Uh, I'm a huge uh, comic book fan, in particular Marvel. And the way I equate it, Youth Bill is Youth Bill USA in itself. We are like the Youth Bill uh, universe, is what I call it, like the marvelous cinematic universe, where you see here pictured in this slide uh, are many of the characters that are either represented in the movies or on their TV shows. Uh, and for our Youth Bill programs, our Youth Bill programs, I see them as being what we what are known as the danger rooms. And for those who are familiar with X Men. The Danger Room was a location uh, in the school that these young people went to where they practiced and learned to develop their, their uh, superpowers. And so at the Youth Build programs and the sites that we are present in, they create a safe environment for young people to learn how to develop the skills that they currently obtain and to work those skills in order to become successful leaders within their community. And so by that, we are actually building future superheroes. Um, <laughs> You can go to the next slide, please. Uh, just, just to let you know, one of our things, when we talk about youth, the youth build mentoring model, we believe that mentoring is a birthright for all young people. Uh, and as you look at this picture here, it, it, what we see here is the entire Marvel universe, and that includes the young leaders that I described earlier. Um, but as far as the youth build mentoring model, um, in and of itself, it's a 12-month mentoring model that incorporates three months of group mentoring with nine months of one-on-one -on -one and then transition. And I'll get more into that in just a little bit. Uh, just to give you some examples of the recruitment, uh, a couple of these things is when you talk, look at recruitment and screening, we look at uh, recruiting uh, for, for an older population dealing with more mature challenges. 
We also believe that in our recruitment and screening process, we should be upfront with mentors and with mentees about certain aspects of each other, uh, including the backgrounds, expectations of the program, et cetera. For example, when um, there was a mentee who was unaware of uh, the background of his mentor, and when it came out, he became he was uh, he was upset and offended, not because of the background of the mentor, but because that wasn't shared with him. And so that broke a level of trust, and it took a while for them to get past that. That's why it's very important for people to be uh, as upfront as possible. Also, with the recruitment and screening, I'm sure this goes through with with just about any other population, a lot of the times for the young people that we're serving, uh, many of the background checks for the for the mentors that are recruited, not many, but sometimes the background checks turn up uh, something in their past that may not allow them to work one-on-one -on -one with the young person, but we find that their background mirrors some of the experiences and the challenges that a young person is going through. So it's believed that they will work they would be able to work well with that young person. So in that sense, we, we uh, oftentimes our programs find creative ways for those individuals to stay involved with the young people in those programs. Um, a part of the training, we talk about training for young people and for the mentors, in addition to mentoring one-on-one, which is giving you the ins and outs of what a mentor is and what a mentor isn't, we also feel uh, that it's best to include and provide additional training <laughs> and support excuse me, on cultural competencies uh, so that they have, the, the mentors, the volunteers have the ability to interact effectively with the young people of different backgrounds and experiences. Uh, some of those things that our young people may be experiencing and are going through challenges with is uh, some of them may be gang exposed and, and or gang involved. Um, they be dealing with youth, we have youth who are dealing with trauma. We have youth that are needing guidance with substance abuse education. Um, and we have the uh, personalities. When you talk about personalities, I'm not necessarily talking about mental uh, mental challenges or disabilities. I'm talking more so about just introverts and extroverts um, and low self low self esteem and things of that nature. And then also, which was mentioned earlier by Dan, we also have youth who are who have physical disabilities. So providing training for our mentors on how to deal with those those different aspects of are, are very important. And then the other thing we talk about um, just the elements of effective practice and how we incorporated into our youth build model. Um, youth, when we talk about the uh, closure, we look at it more as transition. Uh, transition is a very, very important part of the youth experience, uh, especially for opportunity youth. Uh, within our program where we have structure, young people tend to thrive, but we find them having the biggest challenges when they're exiting out of the program and transitioning into either the workforce or post-secondary education, or as some may call it adulthood. And so we find this is an essential time to be able to incorporate the mentors into this aspect. And this is another piece where we talk about the, the matching and the monitoring support and training, uh, make sure we, we provide enough resources to not only the young person, but to the mentor so they can help the young person transition into, into this piece. Um, click it one more time, please. Uh, since our inception of the mentoring model, youth build mentoring model in 2009, <coughs> And I say youth build model, we call it a youth build model, not a youth build program, because as I, I'll get into more detail a little bit later, when we look at it as a youth build uh, program, it, within our organization, it kind of tends to give the element of distancing it from the actual youth build program. So we call it a youth build model that's incorporated in the youth build program. So our youth build models have actually trained um, 7,433 mentors, 7,100 mentees have been trained, and we've matched over 7,000 uh, one-on-one relationships as of uh, June of this year. Um, you'll notice that the number of mentors is higher than the number of mentees uh, as far as training is concerned. And that is because when we first started, we didn't recognize the importance of training the mentor mentees as well as the mentors so they have an understanding of what their expectations is, uh, is and are and how they can best benefit from the mentoring relationships. Next slide. That's me. All right. Thank you so much, um, Corey. Really wonderful information, and I think the superhero uh, metaphor is such a such an inspiring and wonderful approach. Um, and just as we go to our next presenter, I just wanted to remind folks that you can 
um, enter questions into the chat box or the question box, and we'll try to get to those at the end. And um, we hope that this webinar is relevant not only to programs who are already serving opportunity use, but those who might want to get into that area. So think about questions um, for that. And also, um, as we mentioned earlier, preparing young people for their transition is as big a part um, of this as serving them once they're in the transition. So really any programs that are serving teens um, should be thinking about that transition to adulthood. So think about your questions along those lines as well. And we'll try to get to those at the end. So with that, um, I want to uh, introduce our last but certainly not least um, panelist. I bring you Gregory Meves, an employer representative from the Marriott Foundation. Bridges from School to Work program, where he works with young adults with disabilities to help them find employment. Gregory also has a law degree and is the co-founder of a nonprofit that works with kids from the south and west sides of Chicago. Welcome, Gregory. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the Bridges from School to Work program is part of the Marriott Foundation for People with Disabilities. Our program began in 1989, and we're currently in 12 offices around the country in most of the big cities. Um, and basically what we do is we work with young people with disabilities and help them find jobs. So uh, we do a lot of brainstorming to figure out you know, what jobs are going to be a good fit. Uh, we call it a skill and interest assessment. So what are they good at? What do they like to do? What's going to be a good first step for them to get where they're trying to go uh, in life? Uh, we take a look at you know, what's their schedule, what's their location, what's going to be convenient for them to get to and from work uh, conveniently and safely. Uh, we build resumes, we help them complete applications, get them prepared for the interviews, um, basically as much as, as we can do uh, beforehand to make sure that they're as job ready as possible uh, for those interviews and for when they get hired. And then uh, one of our, our big points is that after they, they do get hired, uh, we continue to assist and continue to check in with them uh, to um, just try to strengthen that retention rate and to keep them uh, on the job as long as possible and to get them settled. So that can be anything from uh, helping them with their orientation and paperwork, uh, maybe even stopping in to help them with a certain part of the job. Uh, if they need help talking to a manager or a coworker about something, that's like a conversation that we can have to figure out what's the best way to address that. And uh, that's uh, the Bridges philosophy and, and to continue to support the youth once they are hired uh, as being the key to long-term retention. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So we partnered with the National Mentoring Partnership uh, basically so that we were had another avenue to provide additional resources for alumni of our program. So um, we work with young people 18 to 24. A lot of them are just out of high school. Um, a lot of them have never had jobs before, have never done interviews, don't have a resume, things like that. So we really focus on those basics and um, building up from those basics to, to get them to a point where you know, they're comfortable uh, doing applications on their own and going for interviews on their own and, and doing that. And we have a lot of people who go through our program and they complete it successfully. They, you know, they're on the job for a year, for two years, uh, and then you know they're no longer with the program. But what can we still do to uh, provide them assistance to take those next steps to work on things like networking and career planning, career development? How do you uh, talk to your supervisor about a raise or make a lateral move to uh, get yourself in a better position? And um, Engaging alumni who successfully exited the program and have continued to succeed since then, uh, it's just important for us to, to find as many different resources as we can. And partnering with the National Mentoring Partnership has been um, really good as far as that goes to get some of those alumni some of those additional support. Um, and we're just basically hoping to create a lasting partnership where youth who are able to exit the program successfully have those additional resources moving forward. Okay, thank you to Gregory and to all of our panelists for telling us a little bit about the needs of, of these youth and how several different kinds of program models have, have gone about trying to address those needs. 
um, really helpful to get that um, kind of lay of the land understanding. And um, and here's so much great detail about each of your um, obviously successful and wonderful programs. And with that done, we'd like to present some ideas about best practices with this population for everyone who's listening, um, how you can take some lessons from, from the work of these wonderful folks and think about how to apply them in your programs. Um, so I worked together with all of the presenters to come up with some recommendations, and some of them um, have to do with how programs are structured and managed, while other ones have to do with um, really how to engage the youth and interact with the youth in a positive way. So um, on, the, on the front of program structure and management, we sort of came up with four areas that we thought were worth talking about. And you can see them here, and uh, Corey and Deborah are going to talk a little bit more about these. But they are um, the idea of embedding mentoring in all aspects of transition services, so really threading the mentoring throughout um, the various uh, services and needs that the young people have, gaining buy-in from the top down and making sure there's quality staffing, constructing a welcoming, supportive, and accountable environment for business partners, mentors, and mentees, and building strong partnerships. So um, those were kind of some summary ideas, but Corey and Deborah can tell us a little bit more about these. So Corey, why don't we start with you? Could you tell us a little bit more about these recommendations from your perspective? Sure, you could go ahead and click on. Um, you can just click until this slide is, is completed. Um, so with the way we, we first started looking at mentoring at Youth Build USA, we were looking at, uh, we looked at our core components. Uh, which are leadership, education, graduate resources, counseling, and construction. And the idea originally when we first started was to actually create another core component about mentoring. But uh, thoughtfully, the people who were there at the time recognized how mentoring could actually uplift each of the additional core components. So the thought was and the goal was to, instead of making it its own core component, is to actually embed it into a, into a youth bill mentoring model into the fabric of the youth bill programs, um, which which is which works well. So, uh, first thing we need to be, first things programs have to do in order for you for a mentoring model to work for young people is as was stated is get buy in from the top, uh, and the way to get buy in from the top is to rec actually be able to articulate and recognize how mentoring can help uplift the other elements within your program. And there's a lot of research that has been done to support that. It can be something as simple as, you know, uh, of course, using Mentor the National Mentoring Partnership and their resources there, or just doing an online search and Googling how it can be, how it can be impactful, mentoring can be impactful and helpful. Uh, one of the unfortunate things about mentoring for young people uh, across the country is a lot of it is tailored to young people between the ages of 7 to 13. Um, and one of the things that we do here at Youth Bill and pride ourselves on doing is working with the population 16 to 24 and providing mentoring opportunities for each, each and all of them. Uh, the other thing you want to do in, in creating a youth, uh, a mentoring model at your program for opportunity youth is make sure you educate all staff. The biggest concern that, uh, most staff have at our programs is, is it going to be additional work for me? And that's not what it should be and that's not what it should be articulated. The mentoring model should be something that's created to help not only the young person, but also to help the, the people, your staff at the, your different programs. Um, and it's figuring out, it's going to them and presenting in that way. It's going to a teacher, to a, to a leader at a construction site, to the counselor that's on the site, and that, that's asking them, how can we help with our mentoring, um, help you to do the work that you're doing? Because what actually happens is when you have that mentor relationship be successful, it actually you have additional staff, quote unquote, coming on board to help with your overall overall program. Uh, so the next thing to think about, if you go to the next slide, is actually thinking how do we make that happen? So wh what you want to do is you take a look at your program and say how do we create a successful young person? What are the elements that we have in place at our program that are going to lead to a successful young person? And once you have those elements, uh, you take those, look at those elements, and then you say, how can we break those elements down into buckets? And then if you click one more time on the slide, how do you incorporate mentoring into those buckets? So for us, let's take a look at construction. Uh, one of the things that we, one of the things that happened at one of our programs around construction was there was a young person who was struggling, 
uh, with meeting uh, certification, and it's because he's had, he was having challenges with uh, fractions. And so an informal conversation happened between the mentor and coordinator and the mentor around this, and that mentor took that mentee out to lunch um, and told the mentee that he would buy him a pie. <laughs> and he said he could have as much of the pie as he wanted to do, but we wanted to break it up into, into slices, and he would have to define it in, within fractions. And because of that experience, that young person was able to take what he learned with his mentor, what he experienced with his mentor firsthand, and apply it to his certification he was able to pass. So when you take a look at those, those different core components, values, uh, or goals of your organization, and break them up into buckets, buckets, and then figure how can we make mentoring a part of this so we can create a successful young person with the opportunity youth that we're serving. Um, and then another key thing to think about, and I mentioned this just briefly, is really in order for a program like this to be successful, you have to have a qualified mentor and coordinator in place in order for it to be successful. Not only do you need to have buy-in, but the majority of our programs that are the most successful have a dedicated um, staff of one or more that are, have a fully understanding of what mentoring is and how powerful it can be, but they're also invested within that program but, so they have across-the-board knowledge of all the things that are going on in the program. For example, if the mentor, mentor and coordinator did not have knowledge about the construction piece and the certification that was needed by the mentee, then he would not be able to transfer the information to the mentor in order for the mentor to be able to work with it. And the same holds true in the other buckets that are listed here for our organization, leadership, education, counseling, and graduate resources. Those same things apply with different challenges, things that come up with the young person around that. So when it, within your organization, what you want to do is look at those different buckets, um, define what they are, see how mentoring can fit into those buckets, and make sure that you have a quality, quality person in, on point to lead that. Okay? Wonderful. Thank you, Corey. That's such helpful um, advice, I think, not only because it um, really helps us serve the youth and each young person in a really holistic way and a, and a seamless way, but also we always have this problem in our field of, of working in separate silos and not communicating across our different disciplines. And I really like what you're talking about because it shows how mentoring can be something that helps integrate and bridge all those different um, areas of services. Thank you so much for that insight. Um, wonderful. Okay, so Deborah, what would you add about how to structure and manage good programs for this population of youth from your experiences in the HEARTS program? I think a lot of the experiences are the same. Um, one of the things that we try when we do anything if we're developing partnerships is good relationships that create a win-win situation. So win-win for the staff, and what I tell my staff is they're going to be a partner. They're going to help you do your job better. They're another person who can support these kids, um, just like that great example of the fraction. Um, so they're on your team. The mentees need to understand that this is something that you should be excited about. Sometimes the mentees get nervous. Well, what about my background? And, and who is this person? And are they going to like me? Are they going to leave me? And really kind of addressing those issues and making sure the mentees feel comfortable and that we're there to support them. And then for the mentors, we want to make sure that they understand this is collaborative. They're getting something out of it. Um, people do want to give, businesses want to give. One of the things that we found with our business partners is one, they have such a need for good employees that are going to be successful, that understand all the things that they need to, to come in on time, to be skilled, to do the work. And when you go to those businesses and you can tie in, I'm going to help your bottom line because we're going to give you this great employee. We're going to be part of your team as well. And then the businesses also get to give back to the community, which we're seeing so much with um, as, as a drive for corporations. So really kind of managing and leveraging all of those things is so important and creating great relationships. Um, at the beginning, some of the things we did were the good applications, the screening process, 
finding out and getting to know our our students and our mentors um, and and really making a, a, a good understanding of who they are and how they can you know giving them skills to get along on both sides um, we also have lots of other programs that we're working with. So um, bringing all those resources in, making sure the mentors know that we're not expecting you to do everything and please bring those needs back to us because they're going to connect with that mentor and they tell very often the mentor different things that they may not tell the staff or the case management or the teacher in the program. And so if we all work together, we can really, really create something just awesome for not just our students, but for everybody. Um, and then just look at those um, different events you can do celebrating, you know, the small stuff. Sometimes we forget. And so having those little get togethers or, or sending out something on your, um, your website or, or through other social media, like this happened and this is great and I'm proud of you guys and, and look what, what's going on is so important and support so the mentors can support each other as well. And I just think if you, if you put all these pieces into place, um, it, it, it just soars. It just it helps any program you're doing to help people if you have this component embedded and everybody on board. Excellent thought. Thank you so much, Deborah. Um, great. So now we're going to move into another area of, of recommendations and lessons learned, and this has to do more with how to build the most effective relationships between the mentors and the mentees, um, and for that matter, between staff and the mentees. Um, so Gregory and Dan have both assembled some recommendations along these lines, and they tend to fall in these sort of three categories. One is engaging thoughtful matching practices. Um, another is about being youth-centered, so really making sure um, that we know the youth that we're serving and that we're really taking all their needs into account. Um, when we do the matches, and uh, both in terms of matching and in terms of how we manage the matches. And then, um, particularly when working directly with the youth, the importance of taking a very collaborative approach, and I think both Corey and Deborah also reflected some of, the, some of that idea um, of really working with the youth um, and really engaging their, uh, their agency and empowering them and working in a collaborative fashion. So, um, with that said, I think that Gregory um, and Dan can, can say a little more on these topics, and we'll start with Gregory. Thank you. Yeah, so one of the things that we found um, that's been important and effective uh, in mentoring relationships, uh, both at Bridges and so far through the National Mentoring Project, is uh, having a good mentor match. Um, maybe during that initial intake with the, with the young people, Finding out kind of what their what their career goals are, what their skills and interests are, so that we can match them with somebody who will have that tangible, valuable advice for them uh, in the direction they're trying to go. Uh, somebody who's maybe been there, somebody who's maybe done that or or, or has that experience to uh, translate something that's that's particularly effective for them uh, as they move forward in their mentoring relationship. Um, this just not only uh, entices the youth it just makes them you know more engaged uh, and invested in the program because uh, in the mentoring relationship you need um, both parties to be to be invested and um, to have like a solid relationship going forward and then the other thing is uh, just the personal interaction between the the mentors and the mentees uh, I, I know when I first started um, a lot of the young people I was working with I just didn't really have uh, a good understanding of kind of um, what they might be dealing with or uh, kind of some of the situations that that they grew up in because uh, that wasn't that wasn't me so uh, it took a lot to kind of try to educate myself on that and to be aware of that in dealing with them um, and interacting with them and trying to help them um, just because that you know knowing that or understanding that uh, can help you provide better suggestions for them um, to, to take into take those factors into consideration uh, in looking for employment or or giving advice towards the future. So those are kind of be the two main things that we found to be effective in creating um, lasting and effective um, 
mentoring relationships. Okay, thank you, Gregory. Really, really insightful. And um, Dan, bring us home with some with some final recommendations um, about engaging youth in awesome. an effective way. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so, I mean, just sort of building off of uh, what Corey, Deborah, and Gregory had shared, I just wanted to offer a few sort of closing thoughts before we jump into Q&A. So, number one, I think it's really important as organizations and as mentor-mentee relationships that we focus on collaborating, not directing. Uh, and again, if you look at it from two different lens, when you're in a mentoring relationship, the real role is to understand, again, the context that that young person uh, is living and to meet them where they are. And so when we do that by being super curious and asking really great questions and actively listening to their responses, both the words that they share and the things that are left unspoken, we can at times start to, to think more creatively about ways that we can collaborate with them and move them uh, you know, one step forward, two steps forward, and, and eventually tr closer and closer towards whatever goals they've set for themselves. The same thing applies as an organization. Uh, so instead of directing an organization with the assumptions we make that young people, especially opportunity youth, want or need, is really bringing them into the fold as active participants in the decision-making process. So I hear mentoring programs and organizations across the country often say mentor recruitment or opportunity youth recruitment is one of our biggest obstacles or challenges. By engaging opportunity youth that are already in your programs in designing the recruitment strategies that your program or organization uses, you go right to the front line in engaging that expert uh, in terms of designing your recruitment strategy. And again, the same can be applied across all of the dimensions uh, that Corey highlighted that make up the elements of effective practices for youth mentoring programs. That's real authentic engagement versus directing a young person and sort of telling them what they need or want to do. The second really applies to sharing our experiences and perspectives. So this gets to the point that as mentors and mentoring programs, we're really there to be guides on the side for those young people. So our role is to help them brainstorm various options, reflect on the pros and the cons of those different options, share our experiences so they have something to compare it to that others have been through, and then really empower them and equip them with the tools to apply some critical and creative thinking on how they make their decisions. That's the skill set. That's the hard work that's going to set them up for success, uh, not just in your mentoring relationship, but in life in general, regardless of whatever education or uh, employment opportunities that they pursue. The third is just around challenging growth um, by leveraging past successes and acknowledging, again, sort of taking that strength-based approach that every single one of these opportunity youth brings a set of strengths to the table. And it's easy for us as programs and as mentors and as the field to often look at it from the lens of what are they missing, what do they need, and instead sort of flipping it to say, what are all the great assets and strengths that they already have that we can work with them to apply even more in pursuit of the goals that they've set for themselves? So uh, I just a shout out to on our mentor website, we have this great growth mindset toolkit. Uh, that we've used with lots of mentoring organizations and programs across the country that is chock full of content activities that mentoring programs and that mentors can use to really help cultivate that growth mindset. So to really challenge young people to not get stuck in the way of all the things that they've used to done or used to have done, but thinking about how do they leverage those past successes that they've had to overcome the current obstacles that they might be facing. So again, just sort of framing it differently and challenging them to not get stuck in the moment, but think about something that they've achieved and how those tactics that they use to achieve that success uh, can continue to be used in the future. And then lastly, I would just say is just being super transparent about failures, successes, needs, and wants. And again, I think this looks at the lens of both the mentoring relationship, so being really clear and honest about not just all the things that have gone well for you as a mentor and in the hopes of inspiring your young person, but also being transparent about when you fell and when you uh, didn't hit the goal that you wanted or didn't achieve the things that you had set out to achieve and what you learned from it so that you can help them sort of by role modeling the fact that uh, things aren't always uh, success and sometimes that 
when we face those obstacles uh, as mentors, it sort of humanizes us to the point that we can begin to relate more to the young people that we're aiming to support. Same thing applies as programs. It's really important that when we're meeting with funders and we're meeting with partners in the community, that we're really clear in educating them on the context of the young people that are a part of our programs and the realities, the, the sort of truth and <laughs> bottom line of what is happening in the program so that collectively we can become part of the solution. So again, sometimes we have this tendency to focus on all the things that are going great because we want to look and appear really uh, buttoned up. But the reality is that this work is hard and these relationships are going to hit roadblocks and obstacles. And the more transparent we are about those things all around, uh, both again with each other in our relationships and then in our partnerships as well, the more we're going to be able to advance sustainable solutions, not band-aid solutions, but things that really will start to get at the root causes of some of the issues that uh, opportunity youth and mentoring programs uh, are facing in the work that we're all trying to do. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, and you know, I'm just struck as I'm listening to everyone's recommendations um, about um, both the importance of tailoring our services to our different populations. I'm definitely hearing some unique um, needs of this age group and some of the youth that are more disconnected from the workforce and, and from education. And I'm also struck by the the by seeing that a lot of the recommendations coming through really are a lot of the ones that we see for mentoring in general. And so that just shows me how well positioned our field is to serve this population if we're already working with some of these great ideas about how to work co collaboratively with youth and um, do good matching and and all of those things. So um, I'm just really appreciating that we're all learning such parallel um, things in our different kinds of work, um, but also that we can tailor our services. So um, thank you so much to all the presenters, folks. You have you sort of you heard it here. This is kind of the latest word on um, mentoring for opportunity youth. It's great to get such concrete recommendations from folks doing the work. And we want to turn now to to some time for question and answer. Um, it's great that some of you have already um, submitted questions. We do have. It looks like five or six good questions that people want answered. And I want to give folks one more opportunity to type some of those into the question box or the chat box. Um, I've asked Abigail, our, our driver of the webinar, if we can pull up the slide from earlier um, that showed the, the unique needs of these youth. Here it is. And I just wanted to have this up in front of us while we talk so that people can think about other questions that you have about how to best serve these this population. So I thought having this slide up might help jog some further thoughts and questions because we have, it looks like 10 to 12 or 13 minutes for questions. So um, with that, I'd like to ask Desiree, our question monitor, um, who's been kind of watching the box, what's been percolating out there? What what questions are coming up? All right, thank you, Dusty. And again, I want to echo um, uh, presenters have done an awesome job today. Um, there's one particular question <clears throat> for Corey. Um, could you briefly describe what training looks like for mentees? Um, I think it's very important. He mentioned um, they at first did not ha have a training. So what kind of components? Thank you. That's, that's a great question. Um, there's, there's multiple components. It depends first on the, on the youth that you're serving. So I just want to start off with that. So, for example, if you have youth that are uh, gang exposed and are, are gang involved, there's types of trainings that you want to do for that or those youth who are trauma. And I, I say that loosely because a lot of times the, the youth that we're serving are, you know, trauma-informed youth. Uh, but just the basics, one, helping to understand what a mentor is and what a mentor is not. A lot of them have had informal mentors in their, in their uh, lives, uh, both uh, – positive and negative, uh, and have never had an understanding of what they are, uh, what the, their purpose is. So making it clear for them what those those individuals are, um, how to utilize the mentor and not use a mentor, uh, about developing relationships. Uh, Dan spoke to this uh, more than more than once. It's the key to any mentor relationship, any mentor relationship is the relationship itself. 
and stresses them the importance of, the, of developing a positive relationship with adults. And a, a lot of times the young people that we serve have been in relationships with adults in the past, and adults have made promises that they were going to be around and stick through and have not shown up or didn't stick and stay. So it's it's making sure that they have an understanding that the mentor that's in their life they, they're working with is going to be committed to that to that detail. Um, also, it's explaining to that young person how the mentoring relationship or uh, the mentoring model relates to the program that they're in. For us, as I mentioned before, we have multiple components in our program. So it's explaining to the young person, hey, you're going to be working on construction, leadership development, you have counseling, uh, graduate resources, all these things are in place for you. And here is how you can utilize your mentor to help you in these areas and that your mentor is also educated on these things as well. Um, so those, those are some things, and I, I use that as an example, and you can take that and also apply it to your program. Uh, of course, many of you may not have those comp components that I spoke of, but you can think about it from your aspect. Uh, for example, with the martial arts piece, how can mentor, how the mentor can help them with the, within martial arts and at the same time help them develop leadership, leadership skills. Um, so th those are some things. I'm kind of being broad on it, but those are the things. And you can take the, the trainings um, that are available on Mentor. You also can go to uh, – there are trainings available on our website at youthfield.org youth slash YB Mentoring. Um, we have our community of practice there on mentoring, and there's trainings and technical assistance available there as well that gives more detail about the types of trainings you can provide. Great. Okay. Thank you so much, Corey. Um, yep. All right. We, we can – that tosses out to any other panelists. Um, would you um, disqualify mentors who might have a background, um, or what kind of screening processes um, do you use for background checks? For mentors. So I kind of like that. Oh. Sounded like maybe Deborah had something to say. Was that Deborah's voice I heard? Yeah, I just didn't know if I was talking over so much. I heard someone else <laughs> jump in. Um, Go ahead. We do, like, we do a lot of work with the reentry population. So obviously we need to um, protect our our mentees. So we do do background checks. But if I have a, a youth who has been incarcerated and been involved with the court and I can find an adult who has had that same experience, um, we, you know, see how long ago I'm not, I'm not taking someone who just got out of jail and putting them with some, you know, one of my mentees, but if some time has gone by, if we can get some referrals, we can also do more of a group type mentoring. So it's not just a, a one on one, but we have found that even though it's challenging, doing that is so worth it because that mentor knows exactly what this mentee has gone through. They can't pull the wool over their eyes. They're not going to surprise them. And then they can see themselves on the other side. So someone's dressed in a, you know, someone who's successful, I don't want to say just dressed in a suit, but, but has that success that that mentee wants. And then they find out, yes, when they were younger or, or previously in their lives, they had these same kind of problems and they overcome. It really creates a, a dynamic um, effect on what you're doing. So I encourage you, although it's challenging and it's a little bit hard, it is so worth it to do that. Thanks, Great. everyone. Really yeah, really helpful answer. Was there another presenter that wanted to answer that question as well, it sounded like? No, I think okay, that was me, Dusty, and I was going to I was gonna um, ask that same question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we can go on. We have some other great questions. Thank you so much. Um, well, it really is hard to sometimes recruit mentees that uh, are engaged. Um, so does anyone want to talk about um, how they really get the the opportunity to use engaged in their programs and to stay. Um, maybe even thinking about the incentive, you know, incentivizing or uh, what do you do to keep to to get them in and keep them engaged. 
I can uh, jump in on that one. Um, at, here at Bridges, we do a lot of uh, recruiting at the schools. Um, because we're 18 to 24, recently graduated from high school, we talk to a lot of the graduating seniors a couple months before they graduate, get their information, give them our information, and then you know send reminders over the summer to check up with them. We do get a lot of people who um, reach out right away, right away, right after they graduate, super eager to join. But you know, not everybody's like that. Some people do come in and um, you know they'll come in, they'll meet for a couple weeks, and then they'll disappear for a couple weeks. And uh, I think you know it, it's always a challenge because not everybody is gonna you know be 100% like gung ho going forward. So you just kind of have to um, you know put in the effort to always be reaching out to them, always be like a presence there uh, for when they are ready. And uh, when they are ready, just have like something to offer, um, have have a plan, have you know some some different activities or certain things to work on uh, that when they are ready, um, you've got something there to uh, try to get them back engaged. Hi, this is Corey. I want to add a little bit. Um, the, the, one of the things you want to make sure you do is get buy-in from the young people. And a good way to do that from young people is to have them involved in the process. Uh, if, especially if you're just starting the mentoring program or looking to start a mentoring model at your organization, is to get young people invested and involved so they can make uh, make it their program and not just the organizations. Um, at the start of each year, bringing in a, a mentee council for young people to get involved. And I would say you want to get the leaders within those within the group. And by leaders, I'm not always talking about those young people that are easily identified uh, as being the most likely to succeed. I'll put that in quote. But some of the some of the young people who are the more challenging young people potentially but also you notice that they have the ear of the rest of the population. If you can find a way to get them involved to take leadership in developing the mentoring model or the activities especially that they're going to participate in during the year for mentoring, then that in itself will um, help to get young people more involved in the program as it goes along. And this is Debbie, kind of to piggyback on that, as well as to make sure that you're building that strong relationship, not just with the youth when they first come in, but also reaching out to other agencies within your area that are working with you so that you not only have the youth that you can try to reach out to if they kind of, we call it MIA, they go MIA and we got to go find them and knock on doors and, and see where they're working. But then you have kind of like a team of, a, of a, another, maybe another case manager or you know where the teacher is at school, those types of things. So really um, connecting and getting that information. And then you got to do fun stuff, things that the kids like. Like we have a music recording studio here. We'll do meet and greets or open mic nights and, and different things like that that really meet the kids. And getting, like, like Corey and we are all saying, get the youth involved. They'll tell you. You just have to ask them. Sometimes we forget to ask any population, but especially our young people, um, we forget to ask them and bring them to the table and let them bring their buddies, you know, um, incentivize them. We'll do stuff where we say if you bring um, somebody to the next meeting or you bring somebody to the next event or they enroll, then we're going to give you some money for bringing them in or a gas card or something like that. So got to ask them what they need and, and get them excited. Uh, and one last, this is Corey, and you know, I'll be remiss if I didn't add this. Uh, you need food. Uh, <laughs> if you have food, young people will come. I just want to add that, that little piece. Yeah, one and of the things about food, I'm sorry, with food, what we do, we have a food pantry attached to our program as well. So not only do we feed them when they walk in the door some good food, but then we're sending them home with food. So reaching out to some of your local food pantries and having that. When we're dealing with younger kids, like I want the parents to say, you're going up to heart because I want that food box. <laughs> and it really helps us out. And then it makes the youth feel like they've done something and contributed back to the family when they can say, here, look what I have. So that's another neat idea, an expansion on the food. All right. Oh, excuse me, Corey, Corey real, real, just really quick. Well, another way, another idea to get them involved is one of the things we found to be effective was youth-initiated mentoring. 
And what that is is when the young person actually goes out and suggests uh, back to the organization potential mentors in their area. If you're able to do that and work those those adults uh, that they uh, recruit as mentors into the program, that would give the buy-in too because, again, it's being youth-led. Sorry. Oh, that is awesome. All right, we have time for one more. Um, and just looking at what programs serving teens of all ages should be doing to help prepare youth for their transition to adulthood. So are there any particular um, things that help in this transition of, the, of the adulthood that we haven't covered today? I think some of the things that we have to realize is that it you have to be holistic, not necessarily your agency or your program, but you have to have the resources that are holistic. So housing, you know, if, if, if this person is transitioning, you got to make sure they have secure housing and they have those essential needs of the food and the clothing. And we have a saying like, if you expect ongoing success, you have to give ongoing support. And I think we've all echoed that. And that's even part of the mentoring because we can't be everywhere forever. But if you create that good bond, they're going to get that ongoing support. And just always, if you have that strong relationship, kids leave and, and you're thinking, oh, no, what's going to happen to them? Or, or even they leave angry sometimes. But one of the things we pride ourselves on, they always come back. Like I had a young man in our program and he was in our mentoring and our, our training and our even our transitional housing and then he left and I just get an email from him and he's in Washington and we're kind of talking back and forth and I um they're supposed to have some bad weather. So I get the email of, you know, can you help me? Because I've I've got my apartment and this and that, but I really right now don't have some extra money for food. I'm afraid I'm going to be snowed in. I don't know what to do. And just the fact that they were able to be connected and reach out. And so we were able to help him. And I think that, that's the important key because we grow up and you have, when you have family and you have, you, you have a problem as you, you, you're calling mom, you're calling dad, you're calling your aunts, your uncles, friends that are successful and, and people that you know. But a lot of times this um, this high risk population, this opportunity youth, they don't have that. So we have to become that ongoing support, whether it's us directly or through this wonderful program of mentoring so that we can continue to help them. Uh, Great, would, thank you. you. Well, we, have, we have okay. oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was saying we might not have time to to uh, to finish just briefly if you want to take one second yeah, and then we have to I transition. Yeah, I think a brief one's okay and then we'll transition. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I would say plan it out. It's the individual. It's the young person is is their own individual. So we use life plans. I would say make the life plan a uh, part of that transition so you can determine help the young person determine what they have that are coming up that's going to be challenging the transition, but also looking at some of the, the challenges that you might see as an organization and as a mentor that might be ahead for the young person and plan out how they're going to get to those things and how you can help them. Wonderful. Well, Desiree, thank you so much for moderating that section. What a great, um, lively discussion we've just had. And thanks to all the um, audience members who submitted really thoughtful and excellent questions. And, um, and thanks so much to the presenters once again for having such wonderful things to say. On that last tip about um, really approaching mentoring holistically, I just wanted to add, if people are looking for sort of theory and framework on, on how to do that, a couple places I would look. One is Dr. Jean Rhodes has been doing a lot of work lately on what she's calling embedded mentoring, and that's where mentoring instead of just being friendship based is really embedded into other services um, and she's really promoting that right now and her uh, chronicle of evidence-based mentoring has some interesting stuff about that and then also the foster care field and the juvenile justice field and the mental health field all have a wealth of resources on supporting transition aged youth of all sorts in their transition so some of the life planning and there's lots of curriculum and lots of good stuff out there if folks need other resources. So thank you again to everyone. Um, that will conclude our um, webinar for today. I just have a couple of final slides with some additional resources, and we hope you'll fill out the uh, evaluation as you exit so that we can see how useful today was. 
Um, so uh, on this slide, Mentor scales impact by developing and supporting a national network of affiliates. These affiliates provide the leadership and infrastructure necessary to support the expansion of quality mentoring relationships in local communities or statewide. Mentor affiliates also serve a unique role as a clearinghouse for training, resources, public awareness, and advocacy. We encourage you to find out whether you have an affiliate in your region and connect with them to learn about local resources and training opportunities. Additionally, we encourage you to register your program with the Mentoring Connector, a national database of mentoring programs. This zip code a uh, searchable database allows mentors and mentees from across the country to find your program and is connected to LinkedIn, MBA Cares, Mentor.gov, and so many other avenues for free program uh, promotion. Finally, check out the OJJDP National Mentoring Resource Center website for no-cost mentoring resources to help you apply evidence-based mentoring practices to your program. The NMRC provides evidence reviews on mentoring models and mentoring for specific populations implementation resources from training manuals to mentor guides, reviewed by the NMRC Research Board, a blog featuring innovations and best practices for mentoring practitioners, and the opportunity to request no-cost training or technical assistance. On the next slide, um, as a reminder, one week after the webinar, all attendees will receive an email with links to the uh, Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series webpage where we post the recording slides and additional resources from today. And don't forget, we want your feedback. So at the end of today's webinar, please answer the short survey and help us make these, this series even better. And on this slide, next slide, uh, be sure to visit the CMWS page on the Mentor website for an archive of all past webinars and information about upcoming webinars. So thanks again to everyone for joining us today, presenters, audience, and panelists alike. And thank you to Abby and the mentor crew for, um, for hosting us today. Please join us next month on December 20th for our next webinar on faith-based mentoring. Have a great day, everyone.